For Krima Media's Polity, I'm Sane Lamini. Joining me today is the writer and senior editor at Vice Media Group, Deepo Faloyen, to discuss his debut book titled, Africa is Not a Country. Your book uh, titled, Africa is Not a Country, it aims to dispel the many misconceptions about our continent and its issues. How did the idea of uh, this book come about, if you don't mind sharing with us? I mean, it's something that I've personally been passionate about for a long time. Mm -hmm. um, you know, a, a, I know a lot of people around the continent share my frustrations with the way in which their own countries are often depicted um, in the international media and in books and in popular culture and in films. Our identities are often not fully appreciated for their specificity. Um, and so, you know, for, for me, it's just something that I've lived with. And as someone who works in the media, I've seen often um, the way in which, you know, other media companies um, cover the region. And so it's something that I've, you know, I've long been passionate about doing, dispelling many of these myths um, and pushing it back against the stereotypes. Um, and so I finally decided to, to sit down and write this book and actually do the thing that I've been passionate about doing um, for a very long time. In fact, the second line I think in the book that I read was about the food that is well known in the continent, jollof. I have not tasted the dish, but as soon as I saw the name, I was like, okay, he is from Nigeria. Yeah. <laughs> was I correct? Yes, yes. I am, my, my family are Nigerian. Um, right. I am from Nigeria. Um, it, I mean, of course, because jollof rice is more of a, a, a West African hmm. uh, dish. Um, you know, not, not as big in, in southern and in eastern, in eastern Africa especially. We in West Africa are very passionate about. Mm. So in the book, you also share a bit of information about growing up in Lagos that you also say that it's a city uh, that is home to more than people in New York, London and Uruguay combined. Can you briefly share how Lagos is? Yeah, because you know, I wanted to write about Lagos because it is such a wonderful, unique city. It's made up of, of great triumphs and it's also made up of great challenges as well. Mm. Um, and, you know, for me, you know, our family's hometown, it is built on so much specificity and it is so unique. And so I wanted to, to take readers to this incredibly unique place um, that is, you know, the most populous city and the most populous country uh, on the continent, um, a place that is full of so much so many just varied and diverse identities that I wanted kind of the reader to straight away uh, see and appreciate the fact that, you know, uh, Africa is made up of so many places um, like Lagos that have their own unique identities. It was interesting because a lot of people overseas, they always think of our continent as like an African safari where they just uh, land and then see animals. Yeah, exactly. And I think that, you know, people don't think about, you know, how many urban areas and how the vast majority of people on the continent, they live in urban areas. You know, I've, I've never seen a wild animal in Nigeria in my life. But, you know, when people think about Africa, they think of two things only. Often, you know, they think about poverty mm -hmm. um, or they think about safari. Yeah. Um, and so I wanted this book to be uh, an opportunity for people to see something different and to understand something different that you know yes there are challenges across africa and yes there are you know countries that have wonderful game and and wonderful safari parks you know but that there is a, a lot else uh, throughout mm. the region so what kind of stereotypes are you trying to dismiss in the book and what are the dangers um, of some of these stereotypes in popular culture yeah, I mean, the stereotypes that I want to dispel, the main one is that, you know, Africa is this failing land um, where everyone is the same. Everyone is suffering from poverty and uh, they're sitting around helpless waiting for the West to intervene. And, you know, that is something that we see consistently uh, in popular culture and in the news. Um, this idea that, uh, you know, it, it's 1.4 billion people of predetermined destinies. Um, where the, you know, the, the challenges greatly consistently outweigh any happiness and success. The problem with a single stereotype is that it makes it incredibly hard for people to express themselves, for people to platform their own identities. 
Um, and it makes it incredibly hard for countries who want to, for example, encur encourage tourism, who want investment into their countries um, to do that. Because, you know, when people think about uh, Africa, they think about devastation um, and pity rather than uh, the realities that this is a region of anything and everything. It's a place where, you know, people build wonderful, you know, companies in, in tech and in finance and in, in culture. Um, but of course, you know, it's a place of challenges like anywhere else. So can you tell us about the song uh, that you speak about in the book titled, Do They Know It's Christmas? which was released in the 80s, and I believe it was composed to help uh, the famine crisis in Ethiopia. But you feel strongly that it didn't do justice uh, in getting the message across. Why is that? Firstly, the lyrics, you know, are incredibly uh, insulting to the continent. You know, it's, it's the, the lyrics talk about how there is no joy anywhere in Africa. Water doesn't flow. The only thing that flows is, is people's tears. The, the only hope Africans have every year is to stay alive. We understand that that's not what life is like across the entire continent. That, that's not um, you know, the destiny for every single person who lives in Africa. This is a place of 54 countries, over 2,000 languages, and as I said earlier, 1.4 billion people. Firstly, you have lyrics that are incredibly demeaning and they help to push that stereotype of, of devastation and tragedy that we continue to see throughout popular culture. Um, and at no point in the song does it mention the specific crisis. Um, you know, as, as, as you rightly said, it was aimed um, to raise money for the Ethiopian famine. Um, but instead, uh, you know, it, it doesn't talk about the famine, it doesn't talk about the complexities of the, of the crisis there. And, you know, by doing that, it, it stops people from actually understanding the context that brings about certain issues. Instead, we are just meant to believe that the whole of Africa is starving and it's desperate. Um, and, you know, for, for people across the continent, it, it, it's incredibly insulting. You addressed an important fact that 90% of Africa's material uh, cultural legacy is being kept in the museums uh, outside our continent. Can you give us some brief history about Africa's legacy leaving our continent and why the museums uh, are still not handing back these objects in their galleries? During the colonial era, when the British and the French um, and, and Belgium you know, and other European countries came um, mm -hmm. to colonize Africa and invent these African countries. Often as part of their missions, they would take valuable assets out of the, out of the continent and bring them back to European museums. Um, and, you know, they did so because these uh, items were incredibly valuable um, and they were of great wealth and, and, uh, and great beauty as well. And they kept them. We see that in the British Museum and in, in museums across France and in Belgium. Um, and from the very beginning, they refused to return them. Um, so when I talk about this ongoing theft in the book, you know, I go out of my way to, to make it clear to people that, you know, this isn't something that happened over 100 years ago. It's something that continues to happen. Mm -hmm. The same reason why they refuse to return them then is the, is the same reason why they don't want to return them now, because they bring a lot of value to the countries that they are in. And African countries have, have worked incredibly hard to try and get these artifacts back, but they're struggling you know, to do so against a Western world that really doesn't want to return these items and have decided that hoarding them in their museums is a far better practice for them. Um, it's an incredibly frustrating thing. There is practically no excuse as to why they continue to be kept outside of the fact that they have great value. But it's something that, you know, African countries keep pushing um, and hopefully, you know, the status quo will change eventually. The world-renowned uh, chef now, Jamie Oliver, who made his own version of the jollof rice, a yeah. dish that is loved by millions in our continent. Can you tell us uh, why people were offended by his version? Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I mentioned it, um, it, it's sort of, uh, a, you know, a bit, a bit of a joke. Um, mm. But yeah, you know, it, 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 it just goes to say how passionate people are uh, for this dish and for their country's dish. And I wanted to talk about jollof rice in the book because it's such a great example of how 
in such a short period of time, so many African countries have developed, you know, their own, they've worked hard to develop a specific identity for themselves. Mm. Um, and they're incredibly passionate about their identities. The independence era was only about 60 years ago. And yet in such a short period of time, countries have worked to try and build a sense team. And, you know, one of the ways that you can look at that is through uh, what we call the job price wars in West Africa, mm-hmm. um, where, you know, you have Nigeria and Ghana and Sierra Leone and Senegal um, and a few other countries who are incredibly passionate about their own personal versions of Jalal Price um, and how it means so much to them because it's one way of representing their cultures um, to the world mm. um, in a way that you know hasn't always been appreciated across the world. It, it's a bit of fun as well for these countries to, to, to fight uh, passionately about um, who makes the best version of this dish. Mm-hmm. Um, but it, it, that moment with Jamie Oliver was a kind of a, a fun moment of unity um, when every country uh, basically said that, you know, regardless of who makes the best jollof rice, you know, they can definitely um, say that Jamie Oliver's version uh, was not quite right. Have you received any feedback from people who have read the book, especially people who are in the Western countries? And if if they have read the book, what is their assessment of the book? Yeah, I mean, I've had a lot of really wonderful feedback. I've been very lucky with um, the feedback that I've received. Mm. Um, you know, especially here, I'm, I'm speaking to you from London and here in the UK, you know, I've had a lot of, of teachers who have, who've come to me to say that, you know, the curriculum here in the UK doesn't teach a lot about colonialism. Um, and it especially doesn't teach about, uh, colonialism across Africa, mm-hmm. um, and how these African countries were made and the context, um, uh, behind their histories. And so, um, you know, it's been really great to see that, you know, some schools and, and some teachers have started to teach the book in their classrooms, so that hopefully students here in the UK and hopefully, you know, across the West will grow up with a very different understanding of Africa. Um, and they won't think of Africa as one singular monolith um, and as if it's one country, but they will understand that mm. it is a region with such great depths and such wonderful diversity, diversity of, of history and also of present. Um, and hopefully, you know, that's something that will help shift the narrative away from treating Africa as if it's one big country. Um, but instead, we start to see it for what it actually is. Lastly, are you hoping that your book sparks a conversation uh, to change many misconceptions and stereotypes about our continent that are perpetuated by the Western narrative? Yeah, that's my hope. You know, I, I hope that in the future when people, uh, when people think about it, Africa, they don't think about it as just one giant uh, mm. continent. You know, they think about they think about South Africa, they speak, they think about Ghana, they think about the Gambia, they think about Kenya and Morocco. They want to learn about mm. the individual experiences of individual countries. Mm. And even within each country, there are so many wonderful cultures to get to know and understand and to understand the history that will that will be able to help African countries build stronger individual relationships with the world um, so that mm. they can uh, project the parts of their country's history and the country's present in a way that is effective for them. So I hope that you know people start to appreciate that the people who who live across across Africa have a specificity of identity. The most important thing that we all have is our own individual identities. Um, mm-hmm. And you know it's it's such a shame to see uh, our identities consistently stripped away from us. There was deeper following in conversation with Polity about his book titled Africa is not a country.